yesterday to a degree. So uh, which really building up to what we're probably our rather, which will be our big announcement, which will be on Thursday with Art and a couple other guests. But anyway, I'm going to pass this over to Matthew. Uh, welcome to our conference, Matthew. And I guess to start off with is your story. And, and, and this is great because uh, Matthew obviously is a man and most men do not want to talk about the CSA story. So please, would you share your story to whatever degree you're willing to share with us today, Matthew? And thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It's a real pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, yeah, I, uh, again, I'm a survivor. I use that term in this context, but I, I guess um, I, I've always been looking for another word, you know, because if you ask someone how you're doing and they say I'm surviving, that doesn't inspire much uh, confidence in how they're actually doing. But yeah, I'm, I'm an adult who was uh, sexually violated throughout my childhood. My uncle abused me. I, I can't really remember the first instance of it, but it, it kind of went on throughout my time in primary school and then the first couple of years of high school. And uh, I never disclosed. I did try to speak to a teacher at one point about it, um, but that didn't really go very well. And then I kind of, I ran away from home effectively. When I was 17, I finished high school and I, I left Scotland and I went to England. And um, I started um, just basically putting it behind me or trying to, but I was aware that my uncle was still in contact with children. He was a school teacher himself. He, my uncle so he abused me at home, but he, he also, we, we learned much later that he was also abusing kids uh, in his care. He also ran football teams of young teen boys. Um, and so when I, I went to university, I trained to become an actor. And, uh, and then it was at that point, once I graduated and I started working in television and theater, and it was still hanging over me, like my uncle is still working as a teacher and he has access to children. and. It was almost like only I have this information about how dangerous he is. So I always like to state it wasn't about revenge. It was not about compensation. It was really a matter of child protection that I needed to disclose uh, what he had been doing to me. It transpired that he had abused three of my brothers also. And when I look at, you know, when I look back at my childhood and the fact that the four of us were completely isolated, we're living in the same house with absolutely no idea that the other one was, was going through this too. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, 2007, I wrote a play uh, called To Kill a Kelpie. A Kelpie is, a, well, the Loch Ness Monster is a Kelpie, but there's quite a few of them. It's a Scottish legend about this kind of sea creature. And the legend is that it would appear at the side of the loch as a kind of charming man. And as soon as you get close, he would grab you and drag you into the water, which seemed like a kind of, good metaphor for a child sex offender. So um, I wrote a play about two brothers who were abused in childhood and they, and in the play all they do is talk about it for the first time. And of course it was inspired by my experiences, but it was, you know, it was fictional in a sense. But um, I invited my brothers to see the show and I also invited an organization called the Moira Anderson Foundation. And they're a service provider in Scotland. They support child and adult uh, survivors and victims of childhood sexual violence and so they were there and they posted a crucial discussion and even though like we hadn't discussed it we'd never spoken these words out loud for two decades and uh, just within a few weeks of the play we actually then realized that we had to say something we, we went to the Moore Anderson Foundation they helped us disclose to the police and then our uncle was arrested and so that for me was the beginning of me becoming a a bit, I say an activist, I guess I'm a survivor in that sense, but realizing that I have an opportunity and almost a responsibility as someone who has a platform. In the UK, I was on kids TV. I also write television and theater. So I, I have a platform, I also have a voice and I'm very blessed that I live in a country where there are services who can support survivors and I had free access to those services. And I recognize now having worked in so many countries that I am very fortunate. You know, there's nothing fortunate about being sexual abuse, but I was fortunate that this was done to me in a country where I can access you know, justice. The police, the police department here actually took action. So then well, a lot of things happened. The play went to the United States. Eventually we made a movie version and it was a kind of catalyst for the audiences to with people disclosing in the audience and sometimes for the very first time. And that's when I started to learn about the thing called the statute of limitations, which was it alien to me as someone in Scotland, but the concept that there's a time limit on reporting. So 
uh, after about two years of planning, I decided that I was going to walk around Europe. Uh, so I walked to the capital city of every EU country, uh, specifically asking for the countries to abolish this arbitrary time limit. Um, so that that was the EU, and then whilst I was walking around, you know, going to each individual country, asking them to remove this law, I was invited into the Council of Europe, which is uh, forty-seven nations. So just to clarify, to so you understand that the European Union is twenty-seven countries who have joined together, but Europe is bigger than that. So Norway and um, and Switzerland are not in the EU. You know, there's various countries. So the whole of the continent is forty-seven nations, and they all gather. That's what's called the Council of Europe. So I was invited into that arena to address the governments of all 47 countries in one room. And after doing that, I was invited to chair global discussions at the UN. I was invited into the Vatican uh, to speak with Pope Francis. And it was one of those situations that escalated and escalated. You know, I certainly didn't set out to, to speak to the Pope when I left, um, but it was for me, yeah, it, I just took the next natural step. And so then after the UN, I was invited to Bangkok to work with ECPA International, one of the biggest uh, NGOs in the world, focusing on ending childhood sexual exploitation. And I created with them the, the Global Survivor Forum, which was bringing together survivor activists like myself from as many countries as possible. Um, and we came together and held a kind of uh, live event uh, and the Council of Europe gave us their space, so we did that in Strasbourg. And then last year, obviously we've been through two years of COVID, but um, I was approached by the, the Brave Movement, or what is now called the Brave Movement, the, um, the SAGE, which is Survivor Advocates Global Empowered. There's 15 survivor advocates uh, have come together and the movement has received $10 million to create a global campaign to end childhood sexual violence globally. And so that I'm now, that's what I'm focusing on. It, it's fractured into various different task forces focused on different aspects of this issue. I'm on a task force focused on the G7, where the world leaders are coming together in June. And that's an opportunity for creating global change, of course, having the richest countries around the table. Is that, um, and where I've actually got the, the Brave Movement agenda is already uh, listed on the G7 for, for discussion. So yeah, so now I'm part of the global task force to end uh, statute of limitations. That's one of the task forces I'm on. Um, as I say, my, my only qualification in this work is that I'm a survivor. So it's the, the valid authority of lived experience, I think they called it. So uh, I guess that's what you'd say is my story. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's quite an extraordinary story uh, considering, you know, I can't obviously speak for your experience. I know from my experience, from where I started and taking care of myself to where I am now is quite a bit different and the things that I've gotten myself in involved in, in in regards to advocating on top of taking care of myself so it's amazing how things change over the years and how 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 we evolve at the same time I guess in a sense we're healing ourselves but at the same time you know uh, like you've been doing you've been fighting for something that's not many people will fight for and uh, and uh, you know um, I, I wanted to ask too um in throughout those years that, uh, that you've been doing this, uh, uh, how about your brothers did they, did, and, and yourself? Now, did, did all of you go for, uh, for, for some kind of help in regards to therapy to get past this? How, how did that work out for you? Obviously, you're doing what you're doing, but what about your brothers, if I can ask? You, I mean, you can ask. <laughs> they, they, yeah. um, they didn't waive their anonymity. So when I wrote a book for young people about how to recover, um, I, I asked them how they wanted to be represented in my experience. Um, so we, we give them a, a different name, but yeah, I mean, of course, I think it, it, we all had the same offender. We all went through the same experiences as such, but we're all individuals. So the way that we reacted to that is very in, is individual. So, you know, I, I was very fortunate that I, I was, I was, had services around me and I, I had people around me who were encouraging me to access those services. And my brothers didn't have those same people around them at different times. So um, I think it's, it's yeah, I think this healing services is not one size fits all, you know, because everyone's different. Mm -hmm. And some people are naturally resilient and some people aren't, you know. And I, I, I think what's very humbling in this work is that I, I realized how blessed I've really been 
um, in my in my recovery. And it's I always say recovery is a, a direction. It's it's not a destination. You don't arrive at a point where you're fully healed, but you start your healing journey. And it's never too late to start healing. You know, you can be in your sixties or eighties. You can still start healing at any point. But I feel very blessed. Like I ran away from home when I was seventeen. I met someone who was also a survivor, and she encouraged me to to get help and she told me where to get that help so i started therapy within four years of the abuse stopping my brothers didn't start until decades after that and so you know i meet people who are just disclosing now for the first time no matter what age they are i kind of feel like i'm 20 years down the road of recovery which doesn't mean i'm recovered it just means i'm a lot further down the road so i can sit and talk to you guys on this webinar in a different country about these things and other people are still struggling to to have that first conversation so you know, I think just respect wherever you are on that healing journey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so do you think in the UK now overall that the actual, this actual topic of CSA or childhood sexual abuse, do you believe that it's becoming more open now? Obviously what you're doing now with SAGE and the Brave Movement is gonna be a huge part of this, but prior to that, um, how is that getting your word out there and, and doing what you were doing and talking about that? Do you think it's any easier today than it was, let's say even a year ago? or well, even pre-pandemic, uh, how has that changed in, in a sense that, that yeah. yeah, I'm talking about this now, but are you listening to me or, or am I just gonna be swept under the carpet? How do you think that's working these days? I think it's like today, as I'm talking to you guys, it's the afternoon here in London. And this morning I did 14 interviews back to back because this in the UK is Safeguarding Awareness Week with TESS Global, I'm gonna plug them these guys, TESS Global. And then they, so they set up these interviews to talk about, they've, they've got a whole week of events. And one of the events that I'm, I'm giving is a, a webinar on how to handle disclosures, you know, do's and don'ts, practical do's and don'ts, because disclosures are happening more and more frequently. But sadly, because of the pandemic, there's been an increase in offline abuse. It's weird that we call it offline abuse, but literally uh, there, there is a distinction between online and offline. And that's because, as you guys know, like 90% of abuse or more than 90% is someone the child knows and, and trusts. And so when, the, when we had the pandemic and kids were kind of sent home and many of them were stuck in unsafe homes with unsafe people. And for many kids, you know, going to school for them was the only safe place they had. And the, the converse of that is that we've seen a massive increase in online abuse because the world has just gone online and younger and younger kids. In the UK, we've had self-generated self images of under 10 year olds has gone up by, you know, has tripled, gone up threefold. And, um, and that's because kids are having that smartphones younger and younger these days. So the perception in the UK, like, I don't know, I don't know how recently you guys have had big national scandals, but we had a guy called Jimmy Savile, who's like yep. a kid star. And, and so we had this big case with him revealing that he had over, over 400 victims, way over 400 over his career. Um, and that kind of changed the culture here, you know, and it kind of opened the door for discussion. It used to be that childhood sexual violence or child sexual abuse was never discussed. But after Savile, you saw that suddenly you could be sitting in your, in your staff room if you work in a supermarket. You could open a newspaper and everyone could have a discussion then about childhood sexual abuse, which up until that point it hadn't really been something you could discuss in those kind of uh, spaces. So as much as that was a horrendous he was a horrendous man did horrendous things it did help change the culture um so yeah so i think the perception because of that is that childhood sexual violence was something that used to happen and the reality is it's happening now more than ever at any point in history because all the offline abuse is happening as much as it ever did but we also have the added new problem of the online sexual violence which is it's accelerating exponentially now all is not lost we don't need to panic about that we just need to say the world has changed very quickly and humanity hasn't caught up with that change. You know, we're not we're trying to get used to, we want our kids to have a smartphone so we can call them and they can call us and stuff and we can feel safe. But there are, you know, there is, there's new crimes and new problems that that's been created and we're just, the legislation is not catching up with those situations yet. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I'm quite familiar with Jimmy Savile, uh, Jimmy Savile, I should say, and, and, and other, other people that have, have actually been abused by him, because right? I've talked to people over the years, many, or many over many years, uh, survivors from Jimmy, and um, and none of that. But uh, you know, when we talk about scandals, I mean, uh, we could talk about with the uh, the football scandals, for example. I, I know one particular uh, uh, bloke I follow all the time is Dave Lino, and he is an ex footballer, and he has his story out there and what happened to him as well. So, 
you know, it's, it's pretty predominant in, in, in places all over. Like, I mean, even here in Canada and the U.S. are just small examples of where pedophiles have kind of run, run rampant. And, you know, just because they're famous, say, you know, either they were charged and, and put in jail or not. And, uh, then, and then society's left out to pick up the pieces. But uh, it's only bits and fragments. We hear about it here and there. And, and this is kind of like what kind of brings me to what we're going to be talking about. And, uh, and, and you kind of mentioned it briefly, too, is about the brave movement, So uh, which brought you into that from your experiences. So um, it's been a really busy fast couple of months uh, 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 on the, well, what day was that? The 26th of, uh, sorry, not the 26th, but the 26th. Well, okay, just recently, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Brave Movement was launched, correct? Well, actually, the movement launched on March 3rd, but we had that's, the on April 27th. Yeah, That's what I was trying to say. I was going to say May 27th, but we already are in May. And it's not even May 27th yet, but I meant April 27th. And so how do you think that went overall? I think it was a phenomenal event. You know, we, we brought together, uh, well, the Brave movement launched in March 3rd. So obviously, we were already working on it behind the scenes. But what we did was we pulled together uh, national calls to action. So... I got like a list of demands from UK survivors. And then I got that list of demands shared and endorsed by all the organizations around the UK, you know, with their logos. I think there was a national call to action came from about 22 different countries. And this came together within the space of just weeks of the summit. Um, and then that got fed into what's called the global call to action. And that is what's going to be on the table at the G7 in front of world leaders saying, this is what survivors of the world want. And need, and this is what you guys need to, you know, redirect resources and funds into doing. Um, so yeah, so the, the brave movement, we we had uh, the director general of the, the World Health Organization made a statement on our summit. We had the uh, Gloria Estefan uh, read the, the call to action. It was a huge event. It was it was a bit of a whirlwind because I was I was a speaker on that event. Um, I was also uh, helping to structure the event dramatically because I still write uh, television and stuff. So I was looking at this as a kind of two-hour TV show. Like, how do we, what's the narrative for this event? What do, we, what do we want our viewers to understand and take away from this? So, yeah, so I think it was hugely successful. And, you know, ever since then, the past two weeks, I've had a meeting with uh, with uh, Boris Johnson's Sherpa, who's the special secretary for the G7. And we, we had a meeting, uh, Daniela uh, from the Brave Movement was in the UK last week, and we met with the British Home Office. And then we literally sat with someone at the head of the British government and, the, you know, looking at the list of demands from survivors in the UK. Um, and they look at it and they start starting that, that dialogue at the highest level. And it's the brave movement is no one has seen anything like it. It's, it's finally the world is ready for it, you know, and it, it kind of pulls together all the incredible work that's already been going on for all these years. People do incredible work in isolation and the brave movement just brings us all together, you know. So it's, um, yeah, I, I'm so relieved that it exists you know i really like what you said the very last part there and it's the part about bringing us all together and uh you know art and art and i have had this conversation many times now already and one of the biggest problems not just in other countries but here as well is that we all work really really hard but we don't work together and this has been part of the problem so you know this is why i i was so excited excuse me, when I was, I was asked to come and be part of the Brave Boom, but, uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, cause this has been plaguing me for as long as I've been doing this. It's like, why don't we all work together? You know, we're all fighting for the same thing, a lot of the same things. And there, and there's so many different attachments to it, but nobody's winning. It's just, we're all barking and no one's listening. It's just, it, it, it seemed like futile. But now I, I have a really big sense of, wow, are we actually going to be heard now? Are, are we actually going to get something done? There will be changes. Uh, um, I mean, I could talk about Lovren's Law here, even in Canada, as an example. Uh, uh, Charmaine Lovren has been trying to get this done for years. And, and there's just been stonewall after stonewall, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I think the bottom line is, what the hell are they scared of? I mean, as another thing that Aaron and I talk about, what are they, what are, what are they scared of? What are these government people scared of just for us coming forward and wanting change? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's about, sure, it's about justice, but it's not just about that. It's, 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 and when you think about the economic side of it, it's huge, right? And I think people have no idea to what level this really goes at. And this is what I love about the Brave Movement for bringing everybody together because 
we can't work alone. And I've been working alone on doing things myself. And I, and I see from others, people are working alone, but yeah, we get to the first few steps and we fall back down again because no one's backing us or we don't have enough people to help push up the stairs. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that the brave movement, not just as, as one, but as a whole, will really make some changes. So uh, um, now that's all starting to come together now. Uh, uh, it's gonna be in June and it's gonna be in Germany, the G7 summit, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I know the uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Rosalia in uh, in BC, uh, uh, she's part of this group here in Canada as well, and she's part of SAG, and she was actually part of the Brave Movement with you as well, right, uh, uh, Matthew? Uh, and getting this all going. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Rosalia has been an absolute pleasure, which we're going to see her on 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 a part of this conference uh, come Thursday, if all goes well, and which we're going to talk about a little bit more. Which kind of brings me to this now. We want, or we've already started, it's not we want, we've already started it. Uh, Art, you can jump in here anytime you want to as well. But we've started uh, uh, putting together, we want to create a Survivors Council in Canada. And I know, Matthew, you want to do the same thing in Scotland. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. So when we talk about Scotland, or is that going to involve England as well, or is that just going to be Scotland? <laughs> so this is very political. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very political. <laughs> I'm involved in the UK. Uh, well, there already is one kind of in, in the UK, but we can get into the details of it. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of involved in UK activists, survivor activists, but also specifically a Scottish survivor council as well. You know, and, and that's kind of, I'm kind of happy that it's going to work that way because realistically, I mean, not, not realistically, but overall, you guys are two different identities. I mean, yeah, you're part of the Great Britain, but you're still separate, right? In your own, and, and yeah. a lot of things you do and, you know, your laws are not going to be the same as they are in London, as for example, as they're going to be in Glasgow uh, for, for a lot of different things, right? I mean, you, you're two yeah. totally different, right? You are, like the United Kingdom is, is the United Kingdom, like a, like a tiny version of the United States. We are these four nations, but at the same time, we have devolated parliament. So Wales has its own jurisdiction and, and Scotland as well, and Northern Ireland. But um, in, in certain issues, Scotland has very different and more advanced laws than England. Uh, you know, like Scotland is the most is the safest place to be in Europe if you're a trans person. We have the most advanced trans equality. Um, so there is certain issues where Scotland, you know, seems to run ahead. But you know, it is a national movement. A child to sexual violence transcends all cultural borders or anything. You know, so we do need to work together and stuff like that. But I think, yeah, we we, we do need to make the distinction between. I think. My belief is that at some point in the future, Scotland will be independent again. So, you know, and in that day, we'll be able to run our own laws and, and move faster. But, but that's not to say we're abandoning the kids in England. Of course, we'll still collaborate mm -hmm. and stuff. But yeah, it's a very, I mean, I literally can't see right now, but I am actually wearing a kilt. I'm not exaggerating. I walked around Europe in a kilt and that was to be, not to be, uh, you know, I, I'm not in any way anti-English, I live in London, but it's, it's to be identifiably Scottish because we are a separate nation, you know, and spirit and, and, and hopefully economically and well as well but it's very political i don't want to get into it. i i i agree with you and I, even though i was born in canada but my my scottish heritage i have a kilt as well and and i, I and i'm quite honored by that as well so and i don't yeah. get a chance to wear it very often <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah but i mean I, when you guys said that you were starting to put together the survivor council of canada i think there's there's things that i that you guys can teach me and things that, you know this relationship is beneficial across the water you know this is a great collaboration hopefully we can move each other forward so you know i know we've been talking periodically i mean like i said there's been so much going on but so how are you in regards to kind of putting it together like is it is, is it just you and patrick or is it uh, uh, or, or is it you and some other people are putting this together now or or, or starting yeah. to i know we need to talk some more there's no doubt about that uh, mm -hmm. uh to and, and see what's going on and what we're doing but well, how's that working out for you as you just mentioned, Patrick, who I think you've already had on your conference this week, Patrick. Yeah. Sandler, Patrick's based in London, um, and I, I, get, I think he was born in France, but Patrick is essentially an English survivor uh, uh, for all intents and purposes. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm already working as a special advisor to Police Scotland, Scotland Nationalised Police Service. So the, the, the our national police force is called Police Scotland. And they asked me if I would if I would come and advise them. They, they heard me speaking at a conference and asked if I would give them some feedback on a a commercial that they were trying to put together. And because I'm a survivor, I'm also a writer. Uh, that seemed like something I'd be very happy to contribute to. 
So I, you know, it was a, an advert that Scottish police were trying to create to encourage people to disclose, to, to come to them if they had anything to discuss. Um, so, and that began my kind of formal relationship with the Scottish police as a kind of survivor advisor. But it was very, it, as much as it was formal, it was informal. It's just as and when you need something. So if you think of it, the SAGE, which is Survivor Advocates Globally Empowered, we are 15 survivor advocates from across the world. And um, we, we can land in any territory and advise governments everywhere. But I think we'd, we'd like to create a similar thing in Scotland. Like the police have asked me to create a council of other survivors across the spectrum of experience. And I think that's what I'm going to call it because it's like someone who's experienced online abuse, someone who's been trafficked. And, and I do know survivors from these different territories of, uh, of experience. So it, was, it would be important that not only that the panel is diverse ethnically and gender, um, and sexual orientation, all those things need to be in the conversation. But also that, that full spectrum of experience is, is good to have, you know, like um, at the moment the UK has had this online safety bill. So it's most important that we, because that wasn't my experience, mine was all offline. It's important that we bring in someone who can really talk into that from a level of, of lived experience. Um, and so the police, they, they really want me to put that together just for them. And I'm saying, well, the problem if we do it just for the police is that the, the government, the Scottish government, who I've been speaking to, also are excited to create this council. And I don't want it to be two councils because it could start to fracture and we're advising the police on one thing and they're actually getting different advice to the government. It has to be a unified voice. So as much as it's important that we get to feed to all these different entities, we need to have the message needs to be unified. So that's where I was thinking, one of the beautiful things about SAGE is that we're not, we not tied to any government. We are above that in a sense that we are you know we can speak to every government individually but we we are together and our opinions are unified so i think there needs to be a kind of a council that's separate or funding that it helps us sustain what we're doing and nobody's in this for the money of course there's not there'd be a lot of money but the money that runs our, our operation cannot be tied to the police because if they're funding it then what we're doing evaporates it has to be a set what we're doing has to be separate and, and self uh governing as it were so in a sense what i've been talking about patrick and, and, and lucy hughes from mankind uk is another one of the g7 uh task force in the uk we're talking about having a kind of pool of activists it's a bit more fluid and that we have meetings um and where we obviously discuss things and we may get a consensus on how we're going to uh, respond to something but then um it's more informal in the sense that if one of us is busy doing another thing we can call on one of our colleagues one of our one of the pool of, of activists and they can land and have a conversation, you know, so that we, one of us can go and speak to the government, one can speak to the police or which, you know, like at the moment with tests who create online programs for teachers and one of us can do that. But, um, but then again, also, so it's not too much for any one individual, you know, I think this, the weight of this work, you know, it can hit you like a, an invisible train sometimes, you know, I think I'm gonna have to like flatten my back tonight after day, <laughs> back to back, so. So maybe Ark can, uh, thank you, maybe Ark can jump in here now. Any thoughts to what Matthew's saying in regards to our own situation here in Canada versus what Matthew's going to deal with in the UK? The very first thing I want to say is to say just thank you, Matthew. I want to thank you for your spirit. I want to thank you for taking one step after the other across all that distance that you travel, just one step at a time. And carrying with you voices from other parts of the world you did that and i'm so grateful that you did that as to what's happening here in canada uh, the survivors council canada is already happening it, th this is it right here right now mm -hmm. what we're doing right now in this conversation is the quality of a survivors council of canada and at the current time it's consisting of uh, Stuart, myself, Maria, the executive director from the Gatehouse, Rosalia Rivera from, she's with Sage, Christy White, who is an extraordinary human being representing the indigenous populations. She's an indigenous child author, just a remarkable person. In fact, she would even be sitting in on this session today, but she's actually in a hospital advocating for somebody who has in their story trauma of abuse and how in hospital settings for indigenous populations around here, they've experienced elements of racism, they've experienced 
the issues of treating people without sensitizing themselves around this person may have been a victim of childhood sexual abuse. She's an advocate in that role right now. So what's, this is live, what we're doing as the council. Mm -hmm. The other piece I just want to comment about is it's so key. Well, two things. One is in the event that happened a couple of weeks back with the Brave Movement, uh, there was a poem read. I don't know, um, Matthew, if you were instrumental in helping with Rosalia putting that poem on the, uh, the, the two hour event that took place. But that poem was like this beautiful pebble that went out and rippled. One person's voice here in Canada speaking with the background that that uh, event had touched so many other people's lives, just like your voice, Matthew, right now, and Stuart's voice is reaching out and touching other people's lives in such a profound way. So I think if we keep on that idea of, it's the human connection, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like here we are from across the great distances and we're connecting. That's mm -hmm. how we're gonna get stronger and stronger. And you mentioned one thing I would like to hear just a little bit more about Matthew. The idea of child protection versus the concept of revenge. One of the key pillars that we're looking at over here in Canada under the Survivors Council is the quality of moving away from a retributive response to abuse and sexual violence to a transformative response. And I could go on quite a bit about that, but I'm just gonna say one little piece that from a transformative perspective, we're really wanting to gather around the person who's been harmed and what are their needs as they go forward. Like you, I have spoken with the police here in Canada about different approaches to dealing with people when they've been sexually harmed. I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about the idea of the notion of, you mentioned clearly, you wanted it to go from, not from revenge, but from child protection. So what does that mean from your perspective? Yeah, I think, thank you. Um, I have this idea in my head that I can't get past, which is about human rights. People call me a human rights activist. Sometimes I'm introduced as a survivor activist. Um, and it comes back to like, when I'm sitting across the table from a government official of whatever country, you know, yes, I, I've experienced the things that I'm talking about and that gives me an insight that perhaps they do or don't have, I don't know. Um, but the one thing that we all have in the human family or in the world is that we have rights. And so I like to make the distinction about in, the, in 1948, we, the United Nations created the Declaration of Human Rights. And this was a statement on behalf of humanity. Of course, everyone contributed, all nations contributed to putting this document together. Um, and then, you know, but the concept of human rights has, has always been there, you know. The governments didn't give you your rights. I always like the North American document was it, we hold these truths to be self-evident all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And the, the, there's the, the distinction is endowed by your creator. The government doesn't give you your rights. You already have rights. Because, yeah. you, because you exist, your rights exist. The government's job is to uphold those rights. When you've got a situation like childhood sexual violence, of course the child's rights are being violated. So whose responsibility is it to help them? You know, you, you have this situation which is happening every day in every country and the governments are not at the other side of the door intervening. It's so that therefore it's the responsibility of, of us, of adults. Because like over a hundred years ago, women marched for their rights, uh, the right to vote. And then 60 years ago, we had the civil rights for black and white quality, people marching for the recognition of their rights. 50 years ago, we had the LGBT marches starting. And then you say, well, when are the kids going to get together and do their big march? And they're not, they're never going to march because a child by the virtue of being a child cannot defend their rights. And that's why in 1989, we redefined the human rights to the, the UNCRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, because there's a, there's a simple distinction, which is that adults have the obligation just because we're grown up to defend the children's rights because they can't do it themselves. And so that's the thing. It's like, for me, as soon as I was 25, I knew it was my responsibility to stop him. I didn't know that when I was when I was a teenager. 
I wanted it to stop, but I didn't really, I had no wherewithal. Who do I go to? How do I do this? But as soon as I became a grown up, as a caller or an adult, I realized that this is it, you know, like your rights to saying like, if you and I were in a room, you know, um, if you and I were in a room, Arthur, I imagine this wouldn't happen, but if you punched me, that would be a violation of my rights. So therefore my rights are your responsibility. So we, we all hope that our rights are upheld. Everyone is holding responsibility to uphold everyone else's rights. And so unless we, unless we, it's about relationship with each other and children's rights only exist if every adult around them upholds their rights. And so we need to, you know, we need to change the culture. I mm -hmm. think your question was about revenge. I think, I mean, it, I don't want to get into talking about faith, but for me, like I was raised in a Catholic household. I'm not Catholic anymore. Although when I met the Pope, it was a real moment because in what half of my brain was going, oh my God, this guy is the head of the institution responsible for the systematic abuse of thousands of kids and the cover up of that. And the other half of my brain is going, oh my God, you know, it's literally God. This man speaks on behalf of God. So, but for me, what's been powerful is the concept of forgiveness. So people get very, very, charged when you talk about forgiveness especially forgiving their offender and for me it wasn't about it wasn't about saying what you did to me is okay it's about saying i am no longer willing to carry around the weight of what you did so i let it go so i kind of released them in that forgiveness sense like i go Phew. and then i i kind think i take responsibility for my healing you know it's it's one of the weirdest things, like if you broke your leg, you go straight to hospital. But if you're suffering from depression, and anxiety, you don't automatically think, I need to do something about this. You know, I think people just carry that on their own. So, yeah, it's, it's um, I can't even remember your original question. Sorry. It's a great, no, it was a wonderful tangent that you went off on a wonderful path. And I think what Stuart and I and Maria and Rosalia, Christy are endeavoring is the idea too of in social transformation not just the discussion about change social transformation that looks at oppression culturally around the planet who's on the receiving end of oppression and exploitation and when we start to do that you we have to talk about transforming our responses and our relationships and our understandings with one another, that we have to do that. And so in practical terms of that kind of transformative social change, practical uh, concept of that would be in our uh, curriculum for children to grow up to it. We teach our children, when the light turns red, you stop at the street corner, why? Well, because if you go on there, you might get hit by a car and die. So it's a life and death scenario. I'm gonna teach you this. Yet, as Stuart said earlier, we seem to be terrified of having curriculum based in our schools to talk about the issue of se sexual violence. What does that look like? How does that happen? Where does it come from? What to do when it happens? You mentioned about going to a teacher and it didn't turn out well. Like, how do we transform that experience? So if a child did come forward mm. to say, this is my experience, what is it that would help that human being be heard yeah. and what would our actions look like yeah. and i think for far too long we've been sidetracked with a revenge culture on a, so many levels globally revenge 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 as opposed to well let's just pause for a minute yeah. i often use the phrase pause meaning providing attention unveils sacred experiences just pause Let's just pay, take a really deep breath, breathe out, listen, and take a start from there. That's just one small little piece. So that I'm really pleased that you're talking about that too, because you're right, forgiveness is one of the most, and more than even forgiveness, but when you mention that word, boy, does that ever take people in a lot of interesting directions. And uh, we've been working on that at the gatehouse for 24 years, those kinds of concepts. So I'm really pleased that you brought that up. Thanks, Stuart, for drawing us to that. <laughs> no, no it, it, it's, it's awesome. And, and, and you know, I, I want to reflect again on what you just said about forgiveness. And, and I know from my experience, uh, when I first heard that word, I go, and my, 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 automatic, my automatic reaction was what the, like, right? 
So, <clears throat> and I still hear this from other people. And, and, I, and I like what you said, Matthew, because, you know, and I can say this in my, even in my own experience is that once I started to forgive myself, then the other things started to happen. It's not about our offender. It's, it's about us and, uh, and focusing our forgiveness towards ourselves is really a hard thing to do. But right away, when somebody says forgive me, what the hell are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Right? I got nothing to forgive for. I did nothing wrong. Well, yeah, we haven't. But what about forgiving ourselves? What about letting go of our pain so we can take care of ourselves? And the reason why I, I, I'm talking about this a little bit more is because this is a kind of a, um, a being a man thing, if I can even use that phrase or terminology. Uh, a lot of men, we, we, don't, we don't want to talk about this stuff to any degree. And, you know, maybe it's the masculine side of us that says, well, forgive. I don't have to forgive. But I hear women talk about this as well. So that's why I thought it was beautiful the way Matthew talked about forgiveness and how he applied it to himself. So, which kind of brings me over to this now. Uh, uh, thank you both. And now, yeah, I got to watch the time here a little bit too. So, well, moving forward, we, we are creating survivor councils. So what do you think are some of the obstacles that, we're, that we are going to have to overcome? I mean, we already know some of them already, but what do you, I mean, the Brave Movement is a great example of how things can get done in a short amount of time. Uh, and uh, as a great example of, you can't tell me we can't do this. Well, we were, we're doing it. So what, moving forward, what do you think some of the roadblocks we could have? And none of that, but as two different countries, mm-hmm. how do you think we can support one another in regards to get past these roadblocks, Arthur or Matthew? Uh, you want to take that one off the road? I'll jump in to, to start us off. <laughs> I think one of the roadblocks is fear in the con in the context of practicing looking away from an issue over decades and decades and decades becomes um, what somebody might say is just a natural response. Oh, we just don't do that. We don't talk about that here. And so an obstacle is kind of taking a light and saying, oh, we're going to have to move the light over here and shine it on this issue about what it is that we are afraid of. And then that would, how do you have a discussion about that fear? How do we sit down and talk so that we can move past things that we find ourselves, how many times both Matthew and Stuart and all the people we've met who've been harmed, talking about interventions that actually generate even more harm for the person who's been harmed. So how do we, I think that's one of the things we have to really get people to sit down and talk about, this is the way we've always done it, as if it's, that's the only way you can do it, to here are some other ideas, how do we even explore these? So that's one of the biggest pieces. Matthew, if you want to jump in. I think one of the issues you see guys might start to hit and I've already experienced is that many many survivors are extremely angry yeah and I'm I I struggle with anger like I I can't connect to the anger because it's probably so big that I I avoid it but there's other survivors who are very vocal and very um, extremely passionate but I think that you know governments are they're, they're inspired by passion but they're turned off by anger so, you know, if, if you create a survivor council, you want that to be open to all survivors. Yep. But there's a caveat that you need, there's a duty of care. If you invite survivors into that space, into that dialogue, you need to, um, you need to protect the, the, the work that you're doing together. And so it's how do you manage being completely open and transparent and inviting everyone into the dialogue, but also managing that conversation so that people don't start to get so emotional that they, you know, we've had people you know, they've done things like chained themselves outside uh, different buildings. Yeah. It's a demonstration. And, and I, I get that. I get why that's, and that's a very powerful statement, but it doesn't open a dialogue. And so, I mean, I, there's a book called Nonviolent Communication that I've studied. And I, I think that's really the way we're going to get to the bottom of this because things like you say, you know, if you, if you make a suggestion, people can have a very visceral reaction to it. And the concept like we need in the UK, we need services for people who have an attraction to children to be yeah. a lot more evident and everywhere like notices in every building you know because if every was every fourth child every fourth girl and every sixth boy experienced sexual violence before age 18 mm. we have a massive percent of the population who really have a problem with that attraction towards children and in, until we as a society accept that and go over that first hurdle which is this is happening 
It's, it's someone in our community or people in our community and reaching out to them compassionately without immediately demonizing them or becoming frightened of conversation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, I absolutely agree. I think it's, it's, um, it's something that hopefully you guys, I mean, I haven't really solved it. I've, I've, I've done events where I've asked for volunteers and then sadly had to look at someone at where they are in their journey of healing and go, you're too raw right now to, to, do, to be involved in this conversation. So it's for your safety and the safety of the public who I'm engaging with in this event that I, I can't invite you into this space today, but hopefully in the future when, you know, when we can have a calm, rational conversation, you can be part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. It's awful. You, you open it up to all survivors and then you say, yeah, but not you because you're, 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 too, you're too raw right now. So that's something that, that it's a, something you're going to face, I think, when you, you know, as you open up and expand and invite more members, how do you manage that conversation be respectful? And I'm, I'm even thinking as you're speaking, I had this wonderful uh, Tai Chi teacher years and years ago. She well into her 80s, a beautiful human being. And I was going through a particular routine and, and she, said, she pulled me aside and she said, if you want to go fast, go slow. And it was just the whole idea of moving in such a way that you actually are moving pretty quickly, but it, it's, it's not just slow, it's gentle that the strength of being gentle, how do you set a container, create a container so that everybody's story can come into that container in such a way that there is one of the first things everybody does is take a breath and listens as opposed to reacting. So you're just making me think of that, Matthew, as you spoke there, at building this, our council here gently and making it clear what our philosophy is we're not a revenge-based scenario. We're not a retributive-based scenario. What we are talking about is creating the space for genuine transformation to take place. And you're embodying that as you're speaking right now for me. So thank you for that. Bless you. Yeah, you know, and I like, again, what you said about how people react when we talk about this. And, and, and I know, and I just use social media as first thing that comes to my mind because if I if I was in, in let's say I, I, I'm on Twitter for example uh, as my as my platform my usual platform I go on, and I see this from other survivors all the time is somebody types in something that's very very triggering and then the first thing they're going to do is react and some people overreact, and, and I get that and by me stating what I'm stating is not it's not it, I'm not saying it's bad and I'm not saying it's good or anything like that it's just a point that you're raw and and this is your reaction from your experience and everybody has a right to you know, express how they feel in, regard, uh, in regards to what happened to them in their experience. But when you're trying to get something done, sometimes overreacting and, 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 and doing that just not just does not quite get it done. So when we when we when Art just mentioned about, uh, what he said, the idea behind what we're doing is we want to be able to go in there and we don't want people you know, I, in other words, I'm not going to go in there and, and cry and talk about my story. I, 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 yeah, I'm going to go in there and say, yeah, well, this, this is, this is what happened to me, but I'm not here to talk about it. I'm here to, I want change. I want you to, to fix this law, or I want you to make this better in the, uh, in the community. So I have better access to, uh, uh, to mental health, for example, or, or, or something like that. But if I'm going to be there and I'm going to be screaming like a crazy banshee chicken, then that's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. I need to go in there with a good, you know, very well focused and, uh, and a plan to, to, to how this could be better. And uh, because one thing I really learned uh, through this whole process of being alive is that anything to do with government, you, you, you know, uh, it, it is a process. And mm -hmm. if you don't have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and you don't have a plan, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to, they're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And push you aside. So mm -hmm. this is what I was quite amazed about with what's happening with the G7 is how they've how it's all come together and it shows me that this is quite possible that they're actually listening to us so uh, it's quite inviting and uh, and quite inspiring to see what members of the brave movement and sag have done to make this actually happen so yeah. as far as us happening here in canada and in over in scotland as as coming together as creating our own councils i can't see that's not being possible whatsoever uh, there's, there can't be, the word no is not even going to be part of that. It's just going to be, yes, this is going to happen. And this is how we're going to go about it. And I love what you said. We, we really need to go with a very soft approach and because we're going to have all kinds of people are going to be angry. Because I think of how angry I was when I started my healing journey, uh, journey rather. And even sometimes now today, I can still get very angry. Uh, 
but I prefer to be passive because I learned my anger just gets me thrown in jail and I get nothing done. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that uh, to what I'm stating, but uh, uh, what about you, Maria? You've been hiding in the background there. I know you, any thoughts to what Matthew and Art have said in regards to our approach? Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing all that you shared and Arthur as well. And I see there's some really great uh, comments and questions. And I think you've already um, answered some of these uh, in terms of the challenges and people getting angry. Of course, survivors are going to be angry. They've been silent for so many uh, years, holding on to secrecy, shame, guilt, all these feelings um, in silence, like suffering in silence. And I know the motto of the gatehouse years ago was no one should suffer in silence. Um, and the unfortunate reality is that that many have for decades, um, and especially male survivors, we were seeing at the gatehouse, um, they were coming out and sharing their story in their late 40s, early 50s. Um, so many, many decades of holding on to that shame. Um, I think I really liked uh, Matthew's comment on, um, you know, being responsible in terms of uh, providing support to survivors and ensuring that, you know, they're ready and whatever ready looks like um, to share their story or advocate um, and not be harmful to themselves and harmful to others. And I think that's not something that's often talked about. So I want to thank you, Matthew, for bringing up that point and sharing uh, with us. Um, and I know we have a lot of work to do, but I know that we're going to be able to get through it together uh, as a global community. And that's what is so exciting about um, what the Brave Movement, Movement is doing and creating the council uh, here in Canada. Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. So we are getting close to that time. So um, I know we could probably talk on more about this and we will be talking more about it and we'll keep you, we'll, we'll keep you all informed as, as we progress, because this is such a big, huge thing. So um, again, I, I, I can't thank you enough, uh, Matthew, for being here today. So any last thoughts, uh, even you too, Arthur, any last thoughts before we wrap this up today in regards to our direction we're going? Um, I, would, I would just encourage you to, uh, to consider, like, I think you, you introduced me to tell my story, and I, I never use the word story, firstly, because it implies fiction in it, but mostly because it implies a beginning, middle and end. And I think, you know, I'm still recovering and there's days when I'm not doing so good. So I think I, I always say my experiences and I would encourage you to think about it that in those terms. And also, I think at one point you said what happened to me and, you know, Weather happens, but sexual abuse is perpetrated. I always say what my uncle did to me or what was done to me. I never say what happened to me because, again, you know, we, we, we have to kind of put the blame, the blame, blame back where it belongs kind of thing. Just mm -hmm. for the ownership of your own experience, your own trauma, I think those two simple distinctions, I think, can help me, certainly help me get a grip on my own healing. So, yeah, not to criticize, but it's just an observation. I would add in... Take it kindly, thank you. And what I want to contribute is a couple of things real quick is to say when on Thursday when we'll hopefully have Christy White and Rosalie Rivera refer, part of the discussion on the council and again I just want to honor their voice and contribution to what we are doing here it's really really powerful the other piece I'd like to finish off with I, whatever number of participants are observing this today I'm in making it I'm offering an invitation an invitation for you to get hold of Maria at the gatehouse to connect with us related to your thoughts and involvement with this idea as we grow the uh, Survivors Council here in Canada. It would be fantastic to have those part you folks join in with us and have a conversation with us. I just really want to reiterate that this is what the council is doing right now. This is what would be happening at any given gathering. So I think it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, experience right now. So thank everybody for, for this today. It's just wonderful. And again, Matthew, thank you for your poem. That's going <laughs> to, that's just beautiful. Well, you guys. No, I really appreciate you inviting me into this dialogue today. It's been really, really illuminating for me as well. And um, I'm, I want you to know that if there's any way I can support your work, let's keep, let's keep this dialogue open. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll be sharing with you any, any, you know, any roadblocks that I hit as well, and we can help figure it, help each other move forward. That would be wonderful. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Maria, any last uh, thoughts before we go? Thanks, sir. No, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing your uh, voice with us today and inspiring other male survivors out there and survivors in general out there for watching this either right now live 
or uh, beyond this, because we, we just don't know who is going to be watching this video maybe 10 years from now and going, yep, thanks, Matthew. I needed to hear that. Thank you. Well, thank you all uh, for being here today. And, uh, and uh, you haven't heard the last of us yet. So uh, we'll be back with as, as things turn and progress uh, uh, for the better, uh, I believe. So thank you all and uh, wish you all a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. I know. Thanks.